Hello, a very warm good evening to all of you and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IS. Welcome to another session of Target Prelims 2023, which shall be the third session for Environment and Ecology. In the prior two sessions, we have covered important areas and the relevant areas in current affairs when it comes to international conventions, organizations, various different issues regarding the amendments in legislations, national legislations and so on, as well as the various protected areas. Now today, we are going to take a look at few of the species which have been in relevance, as well as few of the other pointers which have been in use for the past one year. So without further ado, let us initiate the discussion, starting with the first question of the day. Consider the following statements about Nilgiri Tar. Now, Nilgiri Tar is one of those special ungulate species which require significant amount of conservation because the loss in the number and the loss in population is happening at a very drastic rate because of fragmentation of habitat and other factors as well. So here, it is the only mountain ungulate to be found in India and hence needs utmost protection. Second, the Sholas serve as an ideal habitat for the Nilgiri Tar. It is the state animal of Tamil Nadu and is now to be found only in the western stretches of the state. The Eraviculum National Park has the highest density and largest surviving population of Nilgiri Tar. Now this year Nilgiri Tar is much more important because Tamil Nadu as a state has launched the project Nilgiri Tar. So that is why chances are that you can expect a question coming from this particular area as well. Now we will take a look at project Nilgiri Tar and what are the various components in it very shortly. But before that let us take a look at this question. Let us analyze the statement first. It is the only mountain ungulate to be found in India. That is absolutely incorrect. It is the only mountain ungulate to be found in the southern part of India. In the northern part, that is in the Himalayan ranges, you will find many ungulate species which are present in the form of ibex, hangul and so on. So the first statement is incorrect. The second statement, the shola serve as an ideal habitat for Nilgiri Tar. That is going to be correct. Now here, the Shola vegetation, which is a kind of a typical habitat in the case of the Nilgiris, the Anamalai ranges and the Southern Hill ranges. These are basically forested areas which provide natural grazing grounds for the Tar as well. And that is where they breed, they thrive and they increase their population in these areas. Then, it is a state animal of Tamil Nadu and is now to be found only in the western stretches of the state. Again, wherever you find the absolute terminology, chances are it is going to be incorrect, right? So here the statement is that it is a state animal of Tamil Nadu and only to be found in that state. That is incorrect. Nilgiri Tar is also to be found in the state of Kerala. And it is in Kerala where you have in the district of Munnar, you have the Eraviculum National Park where you have significant population and proportion of Nilgiri Tar concentrated in that region. So here, this is going to be incorrect because it is not only to be found in Tamil Nadu, in the neighboring stretches as well. Then the Eraviculum National Park has the highest density and largest surviving population of Nilgiri Tar overall. So this is going to be the correct statement. So overall, we had to find out which of them are correct. So here, the correct answer is going to be C, that is 2 and 4 only. Now here you have to understand that this project Nilgiri Tar has been launched by Tamil Nadu government in order to increase its population because the threats that it faces, significant amount of threat is because of the population pressure, population pressure of us humans, not these animal species. So here, they, due to increase in population, due to increase in the settlement areas, you have experienced or we all have experienced a kind of fragmentation of habitat and degradation of the existing habitat landscape. So these are the major threats. That is fragmentation of habitat as well as degradation of the habitat landscape. Now, when we say degradation, what do we mean by that? So, for example, these 
tars they require significant amount of pasture in order to feed themselves in order to have regular supply of food now due to urbanization increased settlement areas and so on that particular region keeps on getting constricted and restricted due to which these tar uh, or these individual animals they face a stiff competition amongst themselves for the availability of enough nourishment due to which their population reduces but other than that hunting and poaching also come out to be a major threat that these animals they face so this is an animal which has been designated as the state animal of tamil nadu in recognition of its ecological and cultural significance now here Another step which has been taken in order to increase the awareness about this particular animal species is the observance of the Nilgiri Tar Day. So this again is a trivia that you should know for your prelims examination. So objective of the project Nilgiri Tar, if you will observe, to develop a better understanding of the Nilgiri Tar population through surveys as well as radio telemetry studies. Because regardless of whatever we might say about this particular species, you have to understand that our level of understanding about their own habitat, about the alternate food chains that they can develop, that is very restricted. Not enough effort has been put in, not enough research has been carried out about what needs to be done as an alternate measure in order to provide them a significant amount of protection. Because in the other species, for example, we have launched Project Tiger, Project Lion, as well as Project Elephant. Now these are focused areas and focused programs in order to increase the population. But such kind of a concentrated attention has not been provided here. So, first of all, we need to understand these species in greater detail. Reintroduce the tars to their historical habitat. Now, what has been their historical habitat? At one point of time, these tars were found all across the mountain reaches as well as the hilly portions of the eastern ghats as well as the regions of the western ghat. But now their population has been constricted and restricted to the southern portion where you have a confluence of eastern and western ghats. Then address the proximate threats, degradation of habitat, degradation of the landscape as well as hunting and poaching and increase the public awareness. So in order to increase the public awareness, that is why Nilgiri Tar Day will be celebrated and why it will be celebrated on October 7. That is also because of in honor of ERC Davidar who was responsible for pioneering one of the first studies which was carried out in detail about Nilgiri Tar in 1975. So that is something you should know that October 7 is going to be celebrated as Nilgiri Tar Day. Now UPSC is not going to ask you a direct date like question that whether Nilgiri Tar Day is celebrated on 1st of October, 3rd of October, 5th of October or 7th of October. Such kind of questions cannot be expected, will never appear in the examination. But here you can expect a question that on what basis is that day celebrated. So that can be framed into a kind of a question and you should be prepared for that. Now, after this, coming to the second question. The often mentioned Baula project of Bitter Kanika is for the conservation of which of the following species? Olive Ridley turtles, reintroduction of gharials, saltwater crocodiles and mangrove conservation. So Baula project, that is something which is launched in the Dangmal region of Bitter Kanika. In the Dangmal area or region of Bhitar Kanika. Now I hope we are aware that Bhitar Kanika in Odisha is one of the most diverse areas in terms of wildlife, in terms of biodiversity that we have. There you will find mangrove population, there you will find estuarine existence, there you will find turtles as well and there you also find crocodiles. So this project is for saltwater crocodiles and that is going to be the correct answer. Now why and how do we get to know that it is saltwater crocodiles? Basically Baula in the local lingo is the term which is used to refer to saltwater crocodiles and that is where the program name has been derived from. 
ideally when you think about bitter kanika you will always have a kind of a mental map that either it will be for mangrove or it will be for turtles but this is something different in the local lingo baula means salt water crocodiles now salt water crocodiles across the country they are restricted to certain areas we will take a look at the aerial spread as well when we take up another question with regards to the salt water crocodile but here you have to understand that what will be included in that entire project for conservation of crocodiles how do you carry about the conservation of crocodiles after all the crocodiles are not one of those species which will be easily hunted down and so on but still their population had declined quite sufficiently while majority of these crocodiles were initially hunted in order to get the skin and the leather in order to manufacture various different merchandises but slowly and steadily the conservation program has yielded some fruits now the conservation program is multi pronged first of all for any conservation program which is launched you need a raising of awareness which needs to be done other than that here to protect the remaining population of crocodilians in the natural habitat by creating sanctuaries that has also been done to rebuild natural population through grow and release or rear and release techniques now this is something which is used for crocodile and in certain areas even for conserving certain species of snakes there also you have this particular fundamental of grow and release principle which is used now what is this here first of all from the natural nests the eggs are collected as soon as possible they are put under proper conditions of an incubator so that adverse weather conditions excessively dry conditions etc they don't impact the hatching of the eggs because when it comes to crocodile eggs the ambient temperature condition and the ambient moisture condition is also significantly responsible in determining whether the eggs will hatch properly whether the young ones will develop into healthy mature adults or so on so that is why proper incubation needs to be provided then incubation of these eggs under ideal temperature and humidity maintained in artificial hatcheries and hatching and rearing the young crocodilians in ideal captive husbandry conditions marking and releasing young crocodiles in protected areas and after all the most important part when it comes to the success of any conservation measure is ensuring that whether the result is up to the point or not that is the monitoring system the monitoring and the surveillance system that is very much important now this is being carried out in a widespread area all across the region of bitter kanika there you also have now the situation where frequent census exercise is carried out even though the census exercise for us humans that has been delayed for a quite substantial period but when it comes to the census for crocodiles tigers etc that is being carried out on a regular basis so here you need to understand what are the measures which are undertaken in order to conserve the population and what is the baula project okay now again one of the simpler questions which of the following pollutants belong to the category of secondary pollutants ozone sulfur oxides peroxyacetyl nitrate methane as well as nitrous oxides so which of them are secondary so you have to understand the basic that when we talk about the pollutants especially the air pollutants they are categorized into two parts one is what is the primary pollutant and upsc has repeated questions from this area so this is a particular portion which upsc likes to repeat and then you have the secondary now what differentiates them how do we understand what is the difference between them primary and secondary pollutant so basically if you will observe the primary pollutants they are directly produced from the source of emission they are the direct outcome of the emission which is carried out so directly produced or emitted rather from the source of pollution okay whereas when we talk about secondary pollutant in this case 
the pollutants which have been released into the atmosphere, they stay in the atmosphere for some period of time and that is when the primary pollutants, they will interact, they will react and then they will lead to the formation of the secondary pollutants. So, the primary pollutants, when they stay for a longer period of time, react to form secondary pollutants. Okay? Now, here you have to find out that which of them they belong to the category of secondary pollutants. So, if we take a look at the first one, ozone. Ozone is O3. Now, yesterday also we had discussed about ozone. That tropospheric ozone is a short-lived climatic pollutant that we have. Now, this tropospheric ozone or ground level ozone as it is referred to, how is it produced? It is produced in the presence of nitrous oxides, right, or nitrogen oxides which can be referred to as NOx in the presence of volatile organic compounds. Now, these two will react in the presence of sunlight and that is where you have the production of ground level ozone. So both of these volatile organic compounds as well as nitrogen oxides, these are your primary pollutants. So they will react to form ozone. So ozone becomes your secondary pollutant. Then you have sulfur oxides. Now sulfur oxides, they are released significantly directly either from the industrial emissions that we have or even sometimes from the burning of biomass also you will find sulfur oxides being released even by burning of fossil fuels you have the release of sulfur oxide so this is a direct emission so it is a kind of a primary pollutant so this will be a primary pollutant then you have peroxyacetyl nitrate or pan now in what condition or where do you observe the formation of pan now, if you observe carefully, pan is produced and is the product what we see in the case of the formation of photochemical smog. So, whenever we hear about the term photochemical smog, photochemical smog, it ends up producing significant quantity of peroxyacetyl nitrate. Now, how it is produced is again a complicated reaction whereby, first of all, NOx, that is nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds, they will react in the presence of sunlight to produce ozone. Then the outcome that we have, that ends up reacting with unburnt hydrocarbons in the process and they also end up producing in the eventuality PAN. So, PAN is a final outcome after a series of reactions which takes place. So, this is also going to be your secondary pollutant. Now, what about methane? Now, when we talk about methane, this is released directly into the atmosphere from agricultural purposes, from natural gas, burning of fossil fuels sometimes also. So, methane is a primary pollutant and so is the case with nitrous oxide. These are your examples of primary pollutants. Whereas sometimes when we talk about, let's say, when we talk about even uh, persistent organic pollutants that we have, which are monitored by the Stockholm Convention, they are also example of your secondary pollutants. So many of these pollutants, for example, if you take the case of uh, when you have acid rain. So in that case, acid rain comprises of what? It comprises of nitric acid as well as sulfuric acid. Now, how is that nitric acid and sulfuric acid produced? upon reaction of nitrogen oxides and sulfur oxides with water or water vapor. That is when these acidic substances are produced, which comprises the acid rain. So all these will be example of your secondary pollutants, sulfuric acid, nitric acid, ozone, pan, persistent organic pollutants. These are examples of your secondary pollutants. So here, what is the correct answer? The correct answer is going to be B, that is 1 and 3 only. Now, then moving on to the next question. With regards to the plant Lantana Camara recently in the news, which of the following statements is correct? It is a medicinal herb found in Middle Himalayas and has been put under critically endangered category by IUCN. It is referred to as terror of Bengal 
due to its ability to deplete the indigenous breeds of plants in lakes and ponds. It is native to South America and was introduced in India as an ornamental plant. It has impacted the availability of prey in project tiger areas. So what is Lantana camara? Now this is one of those plant species that most of us would have seen in our day-to-day -day lives. But rarely do we come to an understanding that what this species is. So this is your plant species of Lantana camara as you can see. Okay. Now obviously you can observe that there is a kind of a ornamental aspect and an aesthetic value associated with it. That is why this has been introduced and that is why it was introduced into India. So first of all let us take a look at the option statements and then we will come to the correct answer and then we will talk about all these aspects. So is it a medicinal herb found in middle Himalayas? No. That is going to be incorrect. It is referred to as terror of Bengal. Terror of Bengal is a name referred to another plant altogether. That is again an invasive alien species which again we will be talking about. So this is also incorrect. Then it is native to South America and was introduced in India as an ornamental plant. That is going to be correct. And it has impacted the availability of prey in project tiger areas. That is also correct. Why it is correct? We'll take a look at it. So the correct answer in this case is going to be D. That is 3 and 4 only. Now here you have to understand that Lantana Kamara, yesterday we had talked about another invasive alien species that is Sena spectabilis. Now this Lantana Kamara is also an invasive alien species. Okay. Invasive alien species these are one of the biggest threats to biodiversity and one of the biggest causes for the loss of biodiversity which occurs. That is why under the new provisions of the Wildlife Amendment Act which has been brought in, the central government has been vested with powers in order to control these invasive alien species. Now, what does Lentana Kamara do? First of all, as is the case with any invasive alien species, it grows very quickly. And it grows in the kind of a thicket, a bush kind of a growth is observed in this. Now what it does is, it completely captures the sunlight, blocks the availability of sunlight at the lower level, at the soil level. Now, because the availability of sunlight at the soil level is reduced, obviously, that means the local breeds of the plants, they will be put out of circulation. Now when those local breeds of plants are not available, the biodiversity in general, the ability of the landscape to support various different types of biodiversity, that is also restricted. In many areas of Madhya Pradesh, what has been observed is that in the project tiger areas, there has been a sharp increase in the growth of this Lentana Kamara. Now, as a result of that, the local indigenous varieties of plants, that has reduced. And this Lentana Kamara is not found to be palatable by the herbivores. And obviously, when you have such a thick bush which is present, the herbivores, they don't go through it in order to search for the other plants. Not palatable means they won't consume. From the outside, it appears to us that when a species is herbivore, they can consume virtually anything and every plant variety. But that is not the case. They also have a palatability associated with certain kinds of plant species. So this particular plant, it outgrows the other plant species, meaning that for the herbivore population, that is in general the deer population is the herbivore or the prey population in majority of the project tiger areas. So for the herbivore population, you will observe that there is reduced supply of food. And reduced supply of food means what? Significant amount of competition is observed. And due to competition, what happens is that population experiences a decline. decreases and when the population of the herbivore decreases that will impact the population of tigers 
population of tigers and apex predators in general that also experiences a decline. So this is being cited as one of the major reasons why in many areas and many of the project tiger areas of Madhya Pradesh there has been a decline in the tiger population. It is cited, Lantana Camara has been cited as one of the possible reasons. You have to understand it is an invasive alien species. Now what is terror of Bengal? So terror of Bengal is referred to as water hyacinth is referred to as the terror of Bengal here. Now when we talk about water hyacinth, it is one of those plant species, again invasive and alien species. It significantly outgrows any of the other plants which grow in that area. So that is why in this case also you will observe a very quick growth of water hyacinth and what it does, it covers the entire water region and the entire pond or lake that you have and it continues to block the sunlight here again. So as a result of this blocking of sunlight, you have the aquatic plants, general aquatic plants which can be found. Now these aquatic plants, they are impacted, they cannot grow. And when the aquatic plants cannot grow in that region, obviously the oxygen supply in the water is also limited. So you will have limited oxygen supply. And when you have limited oxygen supply, the ability to support life reduces. So that is where eventually you have reduction or loss of biodiversity. Now various different wetlands in India, they are experiencing a significant amount of damage because of the sudden spurt in the growth of water hyacinth. Now this is again one of those plant species which had been brought as uh, to solve the purpose of ornamental purposes. So that is why once you release them in the wild, they have no competition and they will significantly explode in terms of their population numbers. Now, moving on to the next question. Consider the following statements with regards to fishing cats. Now, fishing cats has been in news quite significantly and it has been uh, repeated in news headlines for the past couple of years. So chances are a question can be asked this time about fishing cats. So they are to be found only in India along with the marsh, along the marshes and wetlands. Then it is the state animal of West Bengal. World's first fishing cat census was conducted in the Sundarbans recently. Which of these statements is or are correct? So the first statement here again observe there is an absolute term used in the statement so only in india that is not the case it is to be found in many other asian regions as well so this is incorrect it is a state animal of west bengal that is going to be correct and world's first fishing cat census was conducted in the sundarbans recently this is also incorrect first fishing cat census held recently was held across the chilika lake area by the chilika development authority they conducted the first census so here which of these statements are correct you have c that is two only which is going to be correct answer in this case. Now about fishing cat, you have to understand that Chilika Lake has got 176 fishing cats as per the census. Now what you need to understand, UPSC will never ask you whether it is 175, 176, 178, etc. UPSC can ask you who conducted that census. So the census was held by Chilika Development Authority in collaboration with the Fishing Cat Project. So these were the organizations responsible for that. Now Fishing Cat in general, that is almost twice the size of the normal house cat that you have. And it is known to dive underwater in order to catch fish. So that is the specialty that they have. That is why across majority of the marshes, wetlands, etc. You will find significant proportion of Fishing Cat. They are found in 10 Asian countries, but recent sighting has not been observed either in Vietnam or Java. So other than that, in many of the Asian countries, South Asian countries, you will find the proportion and population of fishing cat. Now in India, 
they are mainly found in the mangrove now this is another important aspect for any species that you are studying any species which has been in news or has been in relevance you should be aware of the areas where they are founded or their natural range areas so fishing cats are mainly found in the mangrove forest of the sundarbans on the foothills of himalayas across along the ganga and brahmaputra valley in and in the western ghats along with the coastlines in many of the areas as well so this is the aerial or the range spread as you can call about of the fishing cats in general okay now then another question with regards to the lion relocation program consider the following statements now we are aware hopefully we are aware that there this has been a kind of a long term project for relocating lions across the various different parts of india because in terms of lion population that we have it is restricted to the gir forests in gujarat only so for a very long period of time since the early 90s itself since the late 80s itself the plan has been a foot to relocate the lions that is why a couple of years back you would have observed that project lion as a separate focused project was also launched why this is in news right now is because of some of the observations made by the court and the judiciary where they talked about the fact that the gujarat government appears to be overprotective and over possessive of lions where it is not ready to relocate the lions in other areas we'll take a look at the detailed mapping of the relocation as well why it is required and so on let us take a look at the option statements so here relocation of lions in india is necessitated by the lack of species diversity then canine distemper virus can impact a large population of lions at the same time Neora Valley National Park can serve as an ideal habitat for lion populations. Which of the above statements are incorrect? Now here, if you take a look at it, the first statement. Now relocation is required when you lack a genetic diversity, not the species diversity. Okay, so here genetic diversity. Now why genetic diversity? genetic diversity is very important in order to maintain the resilience of that particular species in the face of various threats that the species faces so if you have a genetic diversity maybe let's say due to a disease one particular set of population is impacted but the other will be safer in india what we have is we have the same genus of the lion population and that too concentrated in the same area that is why during the time of the covid pandemic there was immediate and immense amount of panic which spread amongst the wildlife officials where they observed that lions are also susceptible to covid virus so once any of these lions they get impacted if they are concentrated in a small area as they are a large population can get impacted simultaneously so that is why it needs to be relocated so the first statement is incorrect now cdv or canine distemper virus can impact a large population so that is true in africa you had the situation during the 90s where at the same time in a obviously a small time scale you had a death of close to around 1000 lions which was observed due to this canine distemper virus so this spreads very rapidly so this is a correct statement Neora Valley National Park can serve as an ideal habitat for lion population this is incorrect lion population in general they will be thriving in areas where you have open forest shrublands you have the scrublands and the forest density is not very high tree density is not very high so generally in grasslands grasslands shrublands and open forests that is the region of lion population the ideal habitat for lion population in general so here which of them are incorrect you have c that is 1 and 3 only these are incorrect now under project lion you had various different protected areas which had been shortlisted for the reintroduction of lion population in that area these were the protected areas which had been shortlisted you had bardha wildlife sanctuary gujarat 
Kuno Wildlife Sanctuary in Madhya Pradesh, Madhav National Park again in Madhya Pradesh. Now Madhav National Park again has been in news recently because one of the tigers from the other region has stepped into this area. So that is how protected areas they get in news. And whenever a protected area is in news, always observe their location and the main type of species or whether there is any other relevant fact that you should know about it. Sita Mata Wildlife Sanctuary in Rajasthan, Mukundra Hill Tiger Reserve, Rajasthan, Gandhi Sagar Wildlife Sanctuary, Madhya Pradesh, and Kumbhalgarh Wildlife Sanctuary, Rajasthan. Now observe that along all of these, you will have one common phenomena. That is, drier climate in general, presence of lot of grasslands, open spaces, and open forest in general. Now, historically or ideally in the initial period, the plan was afoot to introduce the lion population in Kuno. But ever since the cheetah relocation program gained priority, or cheetah reintroduction program rather that gained priority, this took a backseat. Now, the latest information which is given by the various news headlines that talks about the possibility of lion reintroduction in the Barda Wildlife Sanctuary in Gujarat. This is where lions will be relocated in this area. This is at a short distance from Gir and the forest of Gir. So here it is roughly around 100-150 kilometers from the Gir protected region. So this is sought to be as an ideal place for the relocation of lions in order to bring about some amount of resilience as well. Now, this is a kind of a historical chart map of the lion and cheetah reintroduction and relocation programs which have been initiated in India overall. And here observe that it starts way back in the 19th century itself when the population of the lions had started declining quite significantly. It was at that point of time in 1878 when the hunting of Asiatic lions in, uh, was banned by the Nawab of Junagar. 1947, you had the last three recorded Asiatic cheetahs. They were shot down. 1952 was when the cheetahs were declared as extinct in India. Asiatic cheetahs are not to be found in India. Asiatic cheetahs, they are critically endangered species to be found where? Only in the region of Iran. Then 1956, again, there was a discussion which was carried out that gear lions need to be relocated. Now the first step was taken in 1957 itself. And that was the time when you had the lions being reintroduced from the region of Gujarat to the Chandra Prabha, Prabha region in Uttar Pradesh. So if you get a question that this is going to be the first time that the lions will be relocated from Gir, the answer is going to be incorrect because it was tried out for the first time more than 60 years back. So here it was tried out in 1957. Then 1965, the population was increasing. But then slowly and steadily, those lions which were relocated, they could not survive. And it is this incidence which is cited by the Gujarat forest officials when they make the argument in front of the court that look, if the lion population is surviving in Gir area, that is because they are comfortable here. So there is no point of putting them into discomfort. But the emergency situation is that all the lions are restricted in the same area. So they are vulnerable to various different kinds of threats. Now, 65 gear was declared as a wildlife area. Now, overall, you observe that the aspect of reintroduction of lions and cheetahs in the Kuno region that started immediately up after the canine distemper virus outbreak which happened in Tanzania in the Serengeti region, in the Serengeti protected area of Tanzania, where you observe that 1,000 African lions, they died in that area. Then after that, slowly and steadily, because the cheetah reintroduction program that started gaining pace, that is when the lion relocation program took a backseat. Now that the cheetahs are being relocated or reintroduced in Indian landscape from the region of Namibia and now South Africa. Now, once that plan has been set afoot and is rolling, now the stress or the importance and attention is again being paid to the Asiatic lions found in the Gir region. Okay, so that is the aspect. Now, here you will observe that since it came into the purview of Supreme Court, 
that is when a lot of issues were faced and it is at this point of time where even Iran, as we had discussed already, that Iran backtracked in terms of reintroduction of cheetahs or transferring cheetahs into Kuno because till that point of time as Supreme Court has also so said and has said on record that the government is not clear whether it wants to relocate the lions or whether it wants to reintroduce the cheetahs. So that is the overall time scale that has been observed. Okay. Now, then moving on to the next question. In which of the mentioned protected areas is one most likely to find red panda population? In which of these protected areas? Singalila National Park, Neora Valley National Park, then Balpakram National Park and Tal Chapar Sanctuary. In which of these areas will you find the red panda population? Now, red panda population in India is found to be present where? is found to be present typically in the Himalayan region, Eastern Himalayan region. So which of them are in the Eastern Himalayan region? Singalila, Neora Valley and Balpakram. So here the correct answer is going to be 1, 2 and 3. The Tal Chapar sanctuary that you have, it is present in Rajasthan. And this is known for another species, very famous species that is black buck. Okay. Here you will find black buck population. Okay. Where is it situated? It is situated in Rajasthan. So obviously red panda won't be found in the region of Rajasthan. Now recently Singalila National Park has been in use because of the reintroduction of red pandas slowly into the wild areas where selectively few of the red pandas have been taken from the nearby zoo and have been reintroduced into this national park. So that is why it has been in news significantly. Now red panda as a population in India you will find that both varieties of red panda are to be found in India. It is to be found across the portion of eastern Himalayas. Now it is native to the temperate forest of Himalayas and is also to be found in Tibet, Sikkim, Assam, Bhutan and southwestern China. Now both the species they are to be found but when we talk about the Chinese red panda they are to be found in the eastern extremity. It is said that river Siang in general, river Siang that separates the habitat of the Himalayan red panda and the Chinese red panda. Chinese red panda are said to be found on the other side of river Siang, whereas the Himalayan red panda are to be found across the stretches of Sikkim, northern part of West Bengal, Assam, Meghalaya in these areas. The IUCN status is endangered and they are included in appendix one of sites. Now ideally you should not try to learn all of these IUCN status. I understand that is the temptation that we should try to learn as many IUCN status as possible, as many appendix of sites as possible but questions are not asked from that. Questions are generally framed from those particular species which are in use. So that should be the main effort. Now these red pandas are they carnivorous, herbivorous or omnivorous? So these are basically omnivorous. So they can consume small insects, termites, ants, etc. as well as they can consume significant amount of fruit. So these characteristics should be focused upon as compared to the IUCN in comparison. So these are omnivorous species. Okay. And these are also these red panda, they have been declared as the state animal of Sikkim. This is the state animal of Sikkim. Okay. Now, after that, moving on to the next question. Consider the following statements about sloth bear. They are endemic to Indian subcontinent with some numbers in Nepal and Sri Lanka. They are a carnivorous species who do not hibernate. They are listed as vulnerable by IUCN. Which of the above statements is or are correct? Now, sloth bear, T. 
typically found across the Indian subcontinent, some numbers in Nepal and Sri Lanka as well, but majority of the population is restricted to India. Now, these are also omnivores. These are not carnivores. So, the, while the first statement is correct, the second statement is incorrect. These are omnivorous species. Okay? And then, they are listed as vulnerable by IUCN. This is also correct. So here we have to find out which of them are correct. So the correct answer is going to be A, 1 and 3 only. Now here if you observe that the sloth bear is one of the bear species that you find in India. In India you have other bear species as well. You have the Himalayan brown bear also which is found in the western part of the Himalayan landscape in the northern part of India. So multiple different bear species are to be found. Sloth bear is to be found in a widespread region across the country. So they are endemic to the Indian subcontinent and almost 90% of the population is concentrated in India, spread throughout the country, not restricted to any smaller part. With small numbers in Sri Lanka and Nepal, they are omnivorous, they do not hibernate. Now, apply your logic. Why will they not hibernate? Because the conditions that they live in Across the tropical regions, generally you will find that the species, they do not hibernate. And that is because the conditions are conducive enough to give you the provision and availability of resources throughout the year. Some or the other resources will be available. So that is why if a species is omnivore, that means they will consistently get a supply of either the vegetation or the species or the other prey that they can get their hands into. So that is why because the resource crunch is not faced, that is why they do not hibernate. Now IUCN status is vulnerable and they are listed in appendix 1 of sites. Okay. Now after this moving on to the next question. Consider the following statements about the leatherback turtle species. Leatherback turtle has also been in news recently. Why it has been in news that also we will talk about. These are the largest living sea turtle species in the world. Marine species like squids pose a big danger to these turtle species and their survival. The Great Nicobar project under construction poses a threat to the habitat of these turtles. Which of the above statements is or are correct? Now here, if you take a look at it, the first statement, these are the largest living sea turtle species in the world. That is going to be correct. And these don't have a very hard shell. If you observe the leatherback turtles, these don't have a very hard shell. So comparatively, they have a kind of a softer shell, but they are able to travel very large distances. All across the coral triangle that you find across Southeast Asia, lot of these turtle migrations will be observed even across the Pacific. Many of these turtle species have been known to cross almost halfway through the Pacific in terms of their seasonal migration that they carry out. Now, marine species like squids, they do not pose a danger because these turtles, they feed on squids, jellyfish, etc. And that is what gives them the required amount of nourishment. At the same time, these turtles, when they feed on squids, jellyfish, etc., that helps keep their population in check. And that is why these turtle species are regarded as keystone species in many of the ecosystems, in many of the regional landscape, because they keep the other population of jellyfish, etc. in check, which can be particularly harmful to certain other organisms. Then the Great Nicobar project under construction poses a threat to the habitats. This is again correct. So here which of them are correct? You have C1 and 3 only. It is because of the Great Nicobar project. Now that Great Nicobar project has been put on hold. It is a 72,000 crore project which includes building up of a transshipment port. Now under the Great Nicobar project this is also relevant even though the stay order has been put but Sooner or later, it will be implemented with some changes, etc. So, it talks about the development of a transshipment port. Okay. Transshipment port. Also, 
development of a greenfield airport airport to be used both by civilian activities for civilian activities as well as for defense purposes then you also have a proposed development of township of township which is proposed to happen in that area and then also development of power project okay power project with a capacity of 450 volt ampere that is the said development project or the prescribed or the proposed development project under the great nicobar project which is to be carried on now here you have to understand that this leatherback species of turtle that uses the region of Great Nicobar Islands. Now, in the Great Nicobar Islands, you have the Galathea Bay protected area as well. So, they use this region in order to carry out nesting activities and nesting exercise. Otherwise, across the other portions of India, you will find this leatherback turtle species to also be to be found across the Odisha coastline and some parts of Andhra coastline as well. Near the region of Rushikolya beach, that is also where you will find some species of leatherback going for nesting exercise. Overall, if you take a look at the regional spread, the overall global spread in their habitats, the spread is significantly wider. Right, they are spread over a very large area. But generally you will observe that they will migrate to the tropical waters when it comes to the time of nesting. In order to carry out nesting, they will always end up migrating towards the tropical waters. And it is in that condition where they approach the southern part of Andaman Nicobar Islands, the Odisha coastline and some part of Andhra coastline is also frequented by these leatherback species. Some sightings have also been observed in the case of western ghats but because or the western coastline but because substantial numbers have not been reported that is why we don't consider the western coastline as a nesting site. Okay now moving on to the next question. Consider the following statements about the red-eared slider turtle recently in news. These are native to South Asia and found across regions of India, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. They are harmful to the other species of freshwater turtles because of their sharp paws. They are typically found across many urban wetlands like the Sukna Lake in Chandigarh. Which of the above statements is or are correct? Now, red-eared slider turtle. We'll take a look at how that turtle species looks at or looks like, first of all. But you have to understand that this is again an invasive alien species. Invasive alien species. Right? Now, it is not native to South Asia. It is not native to South Asia and it is native to the region of the America, South America in general. Now this also, just like with the case of the plants, this has also been brought into India as exotic pets and later when they grow in size, they are abandoned into the wild. And into the wild, when they are released, that is where they ward off their competition. They are harmful to the other species of freshwater turtle, be it a uh, kind of a soft shell or a hard shell turtle species they will always damage them because they have very sharp paws so that is correct and they can be found across many of the urban landscape in india many of the wetlands in india because they grow rapidly and they weed out their competition so third is also correct so which of them are correct so here the answer is going to be b that is two and three only that is going to be correct so here this is the red-eared slider turtle. Now observe the sharp paws that it has. It is with these paws that it is able to damage, fatally damage the other turtle species. So it is basically not a native species. It is found in the Americas, in southeastern United States and Mexico, some part of 
other portions of Latin America as well. Now, because of the trade in terms of exotic pets, they have found their way in India, right? Now, it is spread, already spread across many Indian states and poses a threat to all the other relevant turtle species in general. It is aggressive, drives away the native species and found across urban wetlands, Sukhna Lake in Chhattisgarh, uh, Chandigarh, Temple Ponds of Guwahati, Lakes of Bangalore, in almost all the areas, wherever they are released. Eventually, as they grow up, they are no longer kept as pets and they are released into the wild and that is done very discreetly and that is why it is very difficult to monitor whether these and where these invasive species are being introduced and who is introducing them into the landscape. Okay? Now, moving on to the next question. Consider the following statements about kelp forest recently in news. Now, these are large brown algae which grow in low nutrient waters across the world. Sea otters and sea urchins provide a level of protection to the natural existence of the kelps. Then, these forests have been significantly exploited for resources such as phosphates. Which of them are incorrect? Now here, kelp, these are large brown algae which grow in low nutrient waters. This is incorrect. In nutrient rich water, generally algal growth will be observed in nutrient rich water. Algal growth will rarely be observed in a water body which doesn't have nutrient. And these grow significantly quickly. As you can observe here, the kelps, they grow for a significant amount of height and these are found across the coastal landscape away from a coast slightly now these are significant amount of ecosystem engineers they come into the category of ecosystem engineers now when we say ecosystem engineers these are able to modify their surrounding and that is where a fresh ecosystem of sorts is created where you have different kinds of species which will inhabit the region. So what do they do? Basically, in across the water bodies, especially in the temperate regions of the world, the water bodies, the oceanic areas and the seas, they experience rapid movement in the form of ocean currents, which are consistent in those parts. Now, because of the ocean currents which are in existence, many of the various species of urchins, fishes, etc., they are unable to survive. Now, once the forests grow in that area, they will reduce the flow of water as is experienced in this area. And once the flow is reduced, automatically the condition becomes conducive for various other species to be growing in that. So, sea otters and sea urchins provide a level of protection. This is also incorrect. Why? Because sea urchins, they are responsible for significant amount of grazing and they graze a lot of these kelps and that is why they can absolutely deforest a region which has got significant amount of kelp population. So these sea urchins, they are harmful, very, very harmful. These are one of the biggest natural threats that the kelp forest faces. Now, the nature has got an answer to that as well. The sea otters, they feed on these sea urchins. And that is when they are able to protect the kelp forest and the number of or the population of kelp in general. So, sea otters help protect but not is the case with sea urchin. Now, these forests have been significantly exploited for resources such as phosphates. This is correct. In fact, during the First World War and after that, across the region of Europe, coastline of Europe and North America as well. A lot of these were extracted, exploited because they have significant amount of phosphate. Otherwise, phosphate availability is significantly difficult to have because phosphate being a part of the sedimentary biogeochemical cycle, those phosphates are trapped in rocks for a very long period of time. Now, these kelps provide for easy availability. That is why a lot of them have been exploited in the past. So, which of them are correct? You have incorrect rather. You have B1 and 2 only. That is going to be incorrect. Okay? So, the regions where you find 
the kelp forest in general you will observe that they are found across the atlantic and the pacific coastline that too especially where you have slightly cooler waters in very hot waters very warm waters you won't find the growth of these kelps and that is why in the trop in the temperate regions of the world generally you will find these kelps in existence okay now with reference to the lesser florican consider the following statements these are critically endangered bustard species endemic to indian subcontinent this species is well known for the leaping breeding demonstration done by the male members through conservation efforts the population has climbed up significantly in the last decade which of the above statements is or are correct so here the first statement when we take a look at it so these are critically endangered bustard species that is correct now earlier they would also be found in the region of the neighboring uh, country of pakistan as well but there it is no longer found anymore so in india it is restricted to the regions around madhya pradesh neighboring areas of gujarat and so on so it is in those areas where the numbers are to be found now the species is well known for the leaping breeding demonstration done by the males this is also correct and here through conservation efforts the population has climbed up significantly in the last decade this is incorrect this is one of the species which has experienced a sharp decline in the population that is why in critically endangered so which of them are correct you have b 1 and 2 only which is correct in india where they are found madhya pradesh gujarat some part of southern and southwestern rajasthan also so south eastern rajasthan rather then when we talk about lesser florican they are often time referred to as carmore or lake and are the smallest bustard species to be found in india endemic to indian subcontinent and is known for the male rainy season leaping breeding demonstrations that you have it is critically endangered as per iucn appendix 2 of sites now sites which appendix it is listed in that will never be asked but just for your information sake it is in appendix 2 okay now moving on to the next question before that one of the questions by devesh keystone species okay devesh when you think about keystone understand what is a keystone keystone after all is an english terminology so keystone is used in your architectural purposes it is that particular important stone in a building which holds the weight of the entire building earlier this was used for arches when you had the architecture including arches that is where you would have a very massive and bulky keystone which would hold the entire weight now when we say keystone species in an ecosystem these are those particular species which are very important and relevant for the survivability of the entire ecosystem if somehow those species are put out of circulation or existence the entire ecosystem would crumble for example take the case of an apex predator like tiger now if tigers let's say they go extinct or they are removed from the ecosystem and you don't have any apex predator in that same aspect think about it the deer population will explode isn't it the herbivore population will explode now what will they do it is not so that they will start rejoicing that no tigers are there they will start consuming the food they will start grazing the grasses which are present and that is when over grazing will lead to the destruction of the producer community as well and when the producer community that is the plant or the grasses are not to be found the e ecosystem will become lifeless so that is why tigers are significantly crucial that is a category or example of keystone okay now harit aikar initiative is associated with which of the following so it is an initiative by the income tax department to levy green cess on carbon intensive industries an initiative by nhai to increase the green cover across the major highways of the country an initiative to increase the green cover areas around the income tax department's buildings and an initiative by the income tax department to increase the afforestation efforts by corporate houses which of them do comprise or does describe the harit aikar initiative
This is basically an initiative launched by the Income Tax Department to increase the green cover areas around the IT buildings that you have. So this was launched on the Unity Day, National Unity Day, to increase greenery and create micro forest in around the income tax buildings as well as in the surrounding landscape as well. Now micro forests, these are small concentrated areas where you carry out significant amount of afforestation. Reforestation is not carried out in this case. Please be very clear. Micro forests are always created in most of the cases in the urban landscape by the aspect of afforestation. And this is done in order to have high incidence of biodiversity in that particular area and that is by growing the native varieties of plant species. The plant species which are conducive to be grown in that area in terms of the climatic conditions, in terms of the soil conditions, those species in itself are grown. So these will have a high biodiversity, these will absorb significant amount of carbon emissions as well and provide an increase in tree cover overall. This is done basically by the Miyawaki method. Miyawaki method. Okay. Miyawaki method to bring an area under forest and this was introduced by whom? Akira Miyawaki way back in the 1980s. Last year UPSC had asked a question about Miyawaki method as well. This is to improve the urban forestry, increase the urban forestry by the local native varieties in the designated landscape. Now, consider the following statements in the context of International Year of Millets. India is the largest producer of millets in the world. Millets require a developed soil profile for healthy growth. Amongst the major millets, India generates more produce of jowar as compared to bajra. Which of the above statements is or are correct? So here, India is the largest producer of millets in the world. That is going to be correct. Now, overall, if you take a look at the production of millets, millets can grow in any kind of soil. Overall, if you will observe, millets can grow in less developed soil as well, in uh, poor irrigated areas as well. They are rain-fed crops in general. Okay, Then millets require a developed soil profile for healthy growth. That is incorrect. Now, majority of us, we get confused in terms of the production of jowar as compared to bajra. So, observe here. The major millet production in India, earlier it used to be the situation that Jowar used to be the significantly major millet which would be produced. Observe that amongst the millets produced in India, you will observe that Bajra production is quite significant for the past few years. And that is a thing that you have to note. So Bajra is produced in greater quantities in the recent years. So that is where the third statement is going to be incorrect along with the second statement as well. So which of them are correct? The correct answer is going to be A. That is going to be one only. So here you have to understand that Bajra is produced amongst the major millets. You have three major millets. Bajra, Jowar and Ragi. Bajra occupies the larger space followed by Jowar and then trailed by Ragi in general. Okay. Now the next question. The island has a tropical wet evergreen forests ecosystem with rare flora and fauna like the leatherback turtles, saltwater crocodiles, dugong, etc. The island is home to the Shompen tribe. It was included in the list of the Man and Biosphere program of UNESCO in 2013. Which of one of the following islands in the news is described by the above given passage? Havelock Island. Barren Island, Great Nicobar Island or North Sentinel Island. So here, this has been in news recently again because of the uh, impact or the destruction to the habitat of leatherback turtles which will be observed. So the correct answer in this case is going to be C, that is Great Nicobar Island in general. Barren Islands, Havelock Islands, they are situated significantly in the northern part and same is the case with the North Sentinel Island as well. These are placed and situated in the Andaman group of islands. It is in the Nicobar group of islands where you have the Sunda land biodiversity hotspot. It is there that you have the Great Nicobar 
biosphere reserve as well and it is there that you will find leatherback dugong salt water crocodiles etc okay now with reference to biodiversity heritage sites in india consider the following statements now this has been in news recently because uh, Ladakh's first biodiversity heritage site was declared very recently that is Yaya So was declared as Ladakh's first biodiversity heritage site so that is why biodiversity heritage sites are in news so here these are designated by the state government in consultation with the local bodies under the provisions of the Wildlife Act 1972 Hogre Khan in Chikmangalur, Karnataka is the first BHS or Biodiversity Heritage Site in India. These can include areas of cultural importance and artificially created habitats within them. So here we have to find out which of them is or are incorrect. So we'll take a look at which is the first BHS site. First of all, these are designated by the state government in consultation with the local bodies. It is correct up till this portion, but not as per the provisions of the Wildlife Act. Under which act are these areas declared? These are declared under Biodiversity Act. Biodiversity Act 2002. It is under the provisions of this act that a region is declared. So this is incorrect. Hogre Khan in Chikmangalur is not the first BHS site. You have the Nalur Tamarind Grove near Bangalore. That is the first BHS site in India. These can include areas of cultural importance and even artificially created curated habitats of cultural landscapes as, as well. So that is correct. So which of them are incorrect? You will have C. That is one and two only. They are going to be incorrect. This is the Hogre Khan region of Chikmangalur in Karnataka. Here you will find significant proportion of Shola. Shola vegetation is found in significant proportion here. Now in Chikmangalur basically that region serves as a kind of a wildlife corridor. Wildlife corridor for various species of and various different individual species like elephants, like tigers, all of them they consistently move between the eastern the western ghats region and also between different protected areas in this area so or in the entire vicinity so that is why this is a heritage site so here it has got several floral species that are unique it acts as a wildlife corridor between the kudremuk and the bhadra wildlife sanctuary both of them have got a sizable population of tigers as of now Okay, Bhadra is experiencing some amount of degradation of the lateral landscape because of iron and significant amount of iron which is found in that area. So mining is also being carried out. So that is why Bhadra is under significant amount of stress. But nonetheless, it is blessed with a large population of tigers there also. Now the Nalu Tamarind Grove in Karnataka close to Bangalore, that was the first BHS or the Biodiversity Heritage Site in India okay it is located in Devanahalli in the outskirts of Bangalore and popularly believed to be the relic of Chola dynasty that ruled nearly 800 years ago so here you will find a kind of a tamarind grove a sacred grove and at the same time you will find certain structures are uh, certain older structures to be also found are to be also found in that area which have a cultural relevance then it is in news, this particular topic is in news because Yaya So, that has been declared as the first biodiversity heritage site in the region of Ladakh. So that is why Yaya So becomes important. You can be asked a question revolving around this particular area. So it is a nesting habitat for large number of birds and animals such as the bar-headed goose, black-necked crane, as well as the Brahmini duck and has the distinction of being one of the highest breeding sites for the black necked crane across so that is the unique feature of yayaso in general okay now don't confuse yayaso with pangongso both are very different then moving on to the next question about the scales of biodiversity when we talk about the scales of biodiversity i hope we are aware that we have three different levels of biodiversity 
we have the alpha biodiversity or the alpha scale of biodiversity, the beta biodiversity as well as the gamma biodiversity. So all of them they indicate different conditions of biodiversity and they represent different conditions of biodiversity. So we'll take a look at each one of them as well. Alpha diversity is associated with the largest aerial spread in the measure of diversity. Beta diversity helps us understand the viability of an ecosystem in terms of its survival. Which of the statements is or are incorrect? So here, if you take a look at it, basically, this is the broader aspect of alpha, beta and gamma diversity. Now, alpha diversity occupies the smallest space. It gives you an idea about the species diversity which is present in an ecosystem. In any kind of ecosystem, let's say a pond ecosystem or a nearby, let's say river ecosystem or a nearby, let's say a kind of forest ecosystem. What is the species diversity in that region? That is indicated by alpha biodiversity. Beta diversity, what it does is it has a comparison between two ecosystems. Two different ecosystem is compared in terms of beta diversity. Now, for example, let's say in a large mountain, in one large mountain or mountainous area, let's suppose, you will have lakes as well, you will have ponds as well, forest as well, grassland as well. So multiple different ecosystems are in existence. So if you compare two such different landscapes and you measure the biodiversity between them, that is when you arrive at gamma diversity. Greater the diversity, better is the chance for survivability. Now the survivability of ecosystem, how do we get to understand whether an ecosystem is resilient enough to survive or not? We get that idea with the help of the species, the number of species which are present in an area. Let's suppose in an ecosystem you have only five species which are surviving. There's a kind of a food chain. Now any species in that, if it gets disturbed, the food chain will break. In other situation, let's say in an ecosystem you have 50 different species. You have the development of an entire food web with multi-trophic levels which have developed. So that ecosystem will be much more resilient. And how do we get to know what is the diversity in an ecosystem? Which kind of diversity will represent the diversity in an ecosystem? It will be the alpha diversity. Okay, beta diversity will compare two different ecosystems that whether this ecosystem is resilient or that ecosystem has got greater species diversity. But for an individual ecosystem, it will be represented by alpha diversity. So here, now when we take a look at the question, Alpha diversity is associated with the largest aerial spread in terms of the measure of diversity. That is incorrect. It is the smallest aerial spread. Beta diversity helps us understand the viability of an ecosystem in terms of its survival. This is also going to be incorrect because when it comes to the beta diversity, it will compare two different ecosystems. So let's say one ecosystem has got five species. The other one has got four species. So this will be measured with the help of beta diversity. But neither this is resilient enough nor this is resilient enough. So the resilience of an individual ecosystem will be calculated by what? Will be calculated by the species diversity. So that is where the alpha diversity will measure the viability of an ecosystem in terms of survival. So here the correct answer is going to be C. That is both of them are incorrect. When we, uh, Sanu, when we talk about gamma biodiversity or gamma diversity in general, let's suppose you compare two different areas. Let's say you compare a region across the northern plains and you compare a region, let's say, across the Nilgiris. Now both of them will have multiple different ecosystems. In the northern plains you will have aquatic ecosystem. Maybe in the Tarai belt you will have forest ecosystem as well. You have pond ecosystem, you have marshland ecosystem. So the diversity in all those areas compared to all the different diversity that you observe in Nilgiris, that will be your gamma diversity which will measure that. Okay. So large aerial spread means that which comprises the largest area when you are measuring the diversity. So always gamma diversity will have the largest aerial spread. Okay. Now that is the question for diversity. Now 
which of the following regions can be described as an ecotone. Now what is an ecotone? So when we talk about an ecotone, this is a transition zone between two different ecosystems. Let's say ecosystem A and ecosystem B. The transition zone that you find generally that is an ecotone. Now this is a zone of tension. Zone of tension. In this case, you will observe that conditionalities of both the ecosystems are to be found here. That is why in majority of these ecotones you will find that you have very unique species, very separate kind of species which are to be found only in these ecotones and simultaneously presence of the species who are able to adapt to eco, uh, ecosystem A and similarly the presence of species who are able to adapt to ecosystem B. Due to these conditions, many of the times you will observe that in the region of ecotone, the diversity is very high, the population and the number of species is also higher. That is indicated by what is referred to as the edge effect, which increases the number of species or the total population and the total diversity to be found in ecotones. So which of them are ecotones? Estuaries, marshlands, grasslands. Estuaries, they are an ecotone. Where are they found? They are found at the mouths of the river. So these estuaries will bring about the conditions of saline water as well, as well as the fresh water. So this is an ecotone. What about marshland? Marshland, they represent a transition between an aquatic ecosystem, let's say like a river flowing water and a nearby terrestrial ecosystem. So the banks of the river, they will indicate a marshy area, a marshy region. So that will also be an ecotone. Grasslands, they serve as an ecotone between, let's say when we talk about a forest. Okay. Let's say a forest on one side and a desert on the other side. Now it is not going to be the situation that till one extent you will have forest, very dense trees and right next to it you will have sandy desert. It is slowly something it, uh, which slowly transitions from one kind of landscape to the other. So that is why grasslands, they are included in an ecotone. Grasslands, that is why you will find unique species like elephants. Elephants you will not find in deserts. You will not find elephants in majority of the very dense forest. You will find elephants in those grasslands. So which of them are correct? You have D, that is all of them which are correct. Now here you also have to keep one thing in mind that these ecotones, not necessarily will they always be natural. Ecotones can also be man-made. You can have man-made agricultural fields, etc., which can serve as an ecotone for various different species, various herbivores as well. So that is why the herbivore significant amount of elephant population you will find, they keep on roaming around the crop fields and the crop lands, and that is where the man-animal conflict happens, because for them, it is a kind of an ecotone, but this ecotone has been created by man. Okay? Now, the next question. Consider the following statements about the dolphin population in India. Due to overexploitation, Gangetic dolphin is the only species of dolphin to be found in India. Unlike the Iravadi dolphin, Gangetic dolphins are urihaline species. Project Dolphin is a focused program launched in India for the protection of riverine dolphins only. So here, which of the statements is or are incorrect. Mangroves are uh, zeal patel, mangroves are also uh, a kind of an ecotone. Okay. So which of the above statements is or are incorrect. Due to over exploitation, gangetic dolphin is the only species of dolphin to be found in India. This is incorrect. You will find various different uh, other Iravadi dolphins, etc. And also across the coastline, you will find the marine dolphins also to be found both across the eastern and the western coastline. Unlike the Iravadi dolphins, Gangetic dolphins are Urihaline species. What is Urihaline? Urihaline basically is that those particular species which are able to adapt to different salinity levels, 
we do know that salinity level is an abiotic factor which restricts the presence and growth of population of various species. Now you have certain species who are able to adapt even in fresh water as well as in salt water. Otherwise you will find that the species of fresh water they are unable to adapt to salt water and vice versa is also the case. So you have urihaline means they are able to adapt to both conditions. Now gangetic dolphins they are not urihaline. They are not urihaline. In fact, iravadi dolphins that generally you find across in India, where do you find iravadi dolphins? Across the region of Chilika. Lake Chilika is where you find significant proportion of iravadi dolphins. So this is again going to be incorrect. Then, Project Del Dolphin is a focused program launched by India for the protection of riverine dolphins only. Here also, you have an absolute term which should be a red flag. So this is again incorrect. It is both for marine dolphins as well as for riverine dolphins. So which of them are incorrect? The answer is D. That is 1, 2 and 3. All of them are incorrect in this case. Please be aware you have to find out the incorrect. But in this case anyways none of them were correct. So you didn't have an option in that. Okay. Then the term Karakuram anomaly is associated with. Now, Karakuram anomaly recently in the past month has been in news again. That is why there is a probability of a question to be asked from here. So, what is Karakuram anomaly? Lack of seismic activities in the Karakuram ranges. Lack of precipitation in the Karakuram ranges to the north. Increase in glacial melting across the Karakuram ranges. Growth of glaciers in the Karakuram ranges. So, which of them are referred to as Karakuram anomaly? We'll observe the situation of Karakuram anomaly, but first of all, let us understand that the correct answer in this case is the growth of glacial glaciers or the glacial growth which is observed in the Karakuram ranges. Now, why this has been in news? Because recently there has been a kind of a understanding it was a kind of an anomaly as long as it was not understood. But now the understanding has happened that why in the region of Karakuram ranges, unlike the case of the other mountain ranges in the vicinity, the Himalayas, etc., they are experiencing significant amount of loss of glacier. But the Karakuram, they are experiencing an expansion in the glacial reaches. So observe this is the region of the Karakuram. So all around it, there has been a loss of ice and loss of glaciers all around but that is not the case in Karakuram. Why is that the situation? So now we have found out the reasons or the reasons have been cited significantly. So the first reason is because of water use. Now here what is this principle of water use? So from the Karakuram ranges in the northern portion of Pakistan, you have multiple different streams and rivers which end up flowing. Now as a result of that, lot of that water from these streams, because the population is increasing, lot of that is utilized for agricultural purposes in that area. And when you utilize water on a large scale, what will happen? Evaporation is something which will happen. Okay evaporation will happen. Now this evaporation carries out two different principles and two different impacts are carried out. What are the impacts? First of all, at these evaporation eventually they will lead to formation of clouds. Clouds. Now what do you think? The clouds which will be formed over the region of Karakuram, will they be closer to the surface or will they be very high above the surface? Always they will be very closer to the surface. Now when the clouds are formed closer to the surface, they will block the sunlight due to the albedo which is present. So the clouds due to the albedo, the albedo factor which is very high, they will reflect the sunlight. So they provide natural cooling. Natural cooling. Why? due to high albedo. Okay. Other than that, 
these clouds will also bring significant amount of precipitation in the form of snowfall. Precipitation will also be a common phenomena to be observed in these regions. So that is how the snow and the accreted snow, accumulated snow keeps on increasing. Now here you might have a kind of a query in your mind that the same principle can be applied in Himalayas as well. If anything, in the region, immediately in the foothills of Himalayas, we carry out agricultural practices in a much more extensive manner, in a much more widespread area. So why don't we observe this phenomena in Himalayas? In Himalayas, we are observing melting of glaciers. That is because the atmospheric circulation that you observe in the case of Karakuram, this is restricted in a smaller landscape because you have mountain systems in the south as well. Whereas in the case of the Himalayas, the atmospheric systems that are in circulation, they are driven in a longer area by monsoonal processes as well. Moreover, in the region of Himalayas, you have incredible amount of deposition of black carbon nowadays which is being observed because of pollution carried out all across the northern Indian plains. So this is one of the reason why in Karakuram the amount of snow and ice and glacial extent is increasing. The other reason is attributed to active western disturbance. Western disturbance which originates in the region of Mediterranean Sea especially during the winter season due to difference in air temperature between the Mediterranean Sea and the colder landscape of Europe. So that is where it is a kind of an extra tropical disturbance which develops. It is carried by the westerlies and it is brought over to these mountainous areas. Now in the past few years, western disturbance has been bringing in significant amount of precipitation, especially in the mountainous areas. Even this year, if you observe the last month's news headlines and the news articles, you would have observed that various regions in the area of Jammu Kashmir, in the region of uh, Himachal Pradesh, even in some stretches of Uttarachal and Uttarakhand, in all these areas, significant amount of snowfall has been observed even till end April. So that is all attributed to western disturbance. So precipitation brought in by western disturbance, that also is responsible. So both these factors are responsible for the Karakuram anomaly. Okay? Now, moving on to the next question. Consider the following statements in the context of India State of Forest Report 2021. Now, a new forest report is uh, to be generated early next year. So, you need to look at the previous forest report and go prepared with it. So, the area under mangrove vegetation has experienced a decline as compared to the last report. Tree cover in India has increased by a larger area as compared to the forest cover from the last report. Bamboo forests have witnessed a growth of 26% as compared to the previous report. Now here first of all let us understand what is the difference between the tree cover and a forest cover. Now overall you have to understand that anywhere where a tree grows or a group of trees they grow does not mean that is referred to as a forest. So basically, you have certain set criteria. So if the aerial spread is less than one hectare, or let's look at it in the other way. If any region has got the presence of trees and tree cover for more than one hectare, and at the same time, the canopy, the canopy cover of the trees, what we talked about in the sense of canopy cover, if the canopy cover is greater than 10%, okay, canopy cover is greater than 10%, in that situation, it can be regarded as a forested landscape. So here, basically, the area under mangrove vegetation has experienced a decline as compared to the last report. This is incorrect, okay, because mangrove vegetation has increased. Tree cover in India has increased by a larger area as compared to forest cover from the last report. Now, this is also incorrect because the forest cover has increased by a larger area. Bamboo forests have witnessed a growth of 26%. This is going to be correct. So, the correct answer is going to be C, that is 
three only. A few of the salient points about the forest survey or the uh, basic state of uh, uh, forest report 2021. So they have overall increased and combined that is tree as well as forest cover. They have increased by 0.4%. Now forest cover has increased by close to around 1540 square kilometer in this the very dense forest that has increased by around 500 square kilometer and then tree cover has increased by around 721 square kilometer the five states with the largest increase this is again one fact that you should know where is it that largest increase in forest has been observed Andhra Pradesh Telangana Odisha then you have Karnataka and Jharkhand these are the five states with the largest increase total mangrove cover that has been growing for the last couple of uh, reports if you observe the trend mangrove cover is increasing and in the trend analysis also you will observe that forest and tree cover is also increasing bamboo forests obviously have increased and the area under very dense forest very dense forest means what in this case the canopy cover is greater than 70 percent is greater than 70 percent in general okay notably 17 states and union territories they have already achieved more than 33 percent of their area under forest cover and this is the 33 percent area why is that relevant because this is the designated target as has been set by the national forest policy 1988 to have a geographical spread of more than 33 percent area under forest cover so 17 states and union territories have achieved that and few of them more have to achieve that and in that case will achieve the goals of national forest policy now consider the following statements about vulture population in India now again it has been in news because of the drugs which are basically given to the cattle a kind of an anti-inflammatory drug given to the cattle now that drug is proving to be dangerous and poisonous to the larger vulture population because of bioaccumulation which happens so the population has experienced a sharp decline in numbers due to drugs like acyclofenac diclofenac and meloxicam being used in the cattle species in india the species of indian vulture white rumped vulture slender billed vulture and bearded vulture are designated as critically endangered by IUCN so here I would want you to read the option statement very carefully it is very easy to think about it that both of them are correct but if you observe the option statement carefully population has experienced a sharp decline due to drugs like acyclofenac diclofenac and meloxicam meloxicam is not the one which is responsible for decline in vulture population in fact why this has been in news is because of acyclofenac acyclofenac being given as an anti-inflammatory drug to the various cattle species like water buffaloes etc now they are digested in the body of these buffaloes and the other cattle species and they are converted into diclofenac diclofenac in the country has been banned for a long period of time because by bioaccumulation the vultures would get impacted by that and overall more than 90% of the vulture population declined because of diclofenac. So that is why acyclofenac and recently you had the Indian Veterinary Research Institute submitting a plea to ban acyclofenac and that is why the safe drug of meloxicam that is being prescribed. So meloxicam is an alternative to both of these. So the first statement becomes incorrect then the second statement that all of these species that you find these are critically endangered that is correct so here which of them are correct the answer is b that is two only now here you have to understand these are not the only species of vulture that you find in india overall you find nine different species of vulture so these are not the only species so out of them these four are critically endangered now in the context of climate tipping points which of the following statements is or are correct climate tipping points once crossed 
these can bring about their own accelerated rate of warming of the planet. The number of tipping elements across the globe, they are limited to atmospheric phenomena like greenhouse gas emissions. Exceeding 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming would trigger multiple of these tipping points. Which of these statements are correct? So here, when we talk about the climate tipping points, you have to understand what they are. So before we come at the answer of it, take a look at these broader climate tipping points. Now observe, these represent various phenomena and these represent various different activities. For example, the Greenland ice sheet collapse. For example, the ice loss in the northern part of the, of the Eurasian subcontinent in Barents Sea. The permafrost in the boreal permafrost, that is northern portion of Asia, the eastern, northeastern portion of Asia, the boreal forest and also wherever you will find that there is any kind of change in land use in terms of the melting of ice, etc. It can kick in its own feedback mechanism. It can kick in the feedback mechanism in the sense that yesterday we had talked about the positive and the negative loop in terms of the climate feedback system. Here you have to understand that how it will continue to heat up. Think about it. I will just give you one of the examples of this. Let's suppose the Greenland ice sheet collapses. That is the ice sheet melts. Now that means what? That once this ice sheet melts in this region, now you will have warmer water as compared to earlier. Warmer waters. Now what would that mean? That would mean that this AMOC or Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, which is very important for circulation and transfer of heat from lower latitudes to higher latitudes, this would also collapse. How will this collapse? This will collapse because it will, how is it that this circulation takes place? This is a kind of a thermohaline circulation overall. Thermohaline circulation. Okay. Means what? In the lower latitudes, the water being warmed up, it expands ever so slightly. It tends to flow towards the higher latitudes. When it comes towards the higher latitudes, due to extreme cold temperatures here, the water also becomes cold. When the water becomes cold, its density increases and due to gravitation, it sinks and it is recirculated back. So this is the kind of thermohaline circulation which distributes heats, heat and nutrients across the Atlantic, that is AMOC. But when we have the situation that the northern portion in itself becomes warmer, that means when the water reaches here, it will no longer cool down sufficiently to sink. That means the water will stay stagnant. And if the water does not move, stay stagnant means it will be impacted by the solar rays for a prolonged duration. And prolonged duration of heating will mean a higher temperature range as well. So this is a kind of a tipping point. Similarly, think about the northern expansion of boreal forest in the region of northern part of North America. Now, ideally, this is the portion of North Canada and the region of Alaska, which is covered under permafrost conditions for majority of the part of the year. Now, being covered in permafrost means lower absorption of heat in general, right? So that means the heat received is lesser. But due to climate change, as the temperatures, they start increasing, as you will observe that if the temperature increases by around 4 degrees Celsius and above, the boreal forest will expand in that region. That means the albedo will sufficiently reduce, means it will absorb greater amount of heat, means it will give rise to greater amount of heating overall. So that is how all these climate tipping points, they can trigger their own rate of warming at an uncontrolled pace once the temperature exceeds a particular designated limit. So, now let us take a look at the option statements. Once crossed, this can bring about their own accelerated rate of warming of the planet. That is correct. Then, the number of tipping elements across the globe 
are limited to atmospheric phenomena like greenhouse gas emissions. This is going to be incorrect. And then exceeding 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming would trigger multiple of these tipping points. This is also correct. So here you have C, 1 and 3, which is correct. Okay. Sahil, what is albedo? Albedo is the reflective quotient of any surface. So for any surface, what is the total amount of heat received by the solar energy? Albedo gives us an idea about how much of it is reflected, how much of it is absorbed. It varies between 0 to 1. Now higher the albedo means greater is the reflection. And greater is the reflection of heat means very little is absorbed. For example, ice sheets, glaciers, they have an albedo close to around 0 0.8, 0 0.83, 0 0.84, depending upon the ice mass that we have. For example, if you consider the floodplains or the marshy lands in general, or even the grasslands in general, now they have an albedo of close to around 0 0.2 to 0.3. That means they will absorb greater amount of heat, reflect very little. So that is the factor of albedo. And uh, one more, uh, how boreal forest expansion can lead to warming. See, where is it that the boreal forest is expanding? Please understand, if the forest would have expanded otherwise in a deforested region, it would have been good. But it is expanding in the region where you have the presence of ice cover or ice sheet otherwise. Look at it, that where it is expanding. So this is where... Ideally, in northern portion of Canada in the region of Alaska, that is a region of permafrost. So, significant amount of heat is reflected back. But once you have forest, forests have a comparatively lesser albedo. They will absorb more heat. When they will absorb more heat, what will happen? Yesterday we talked about it. They will release significant amount of water vapor into the atmosphere. And that water vapor basically will retain more heat more evaporation and it will be a positive feedback loop for climatic warming okay so that is the aspect now option two of uh, question 23 so see number of tipping elements here if you observe it is not restricted only to atmospheric phenomena various different elements for example ice sheet collapse for example amazon rainforest dieback everything is included it is not only restricted to atmospheric phenomena Okay, now, then moving on to the next question. Consider the following statements with respect to glass frogs recently in news. Now, glass frogs as a species, they will have multiple different genetics and varieties within them. Many of few of them are designated as vulnerable, few of them as uh, threatened, and very few of them have also been designated as critically endangered. Now, these glass frogs are in use because significant amount of research is being carried out because of a very specific ability that they have. And what is that ability? The ability is to look transparent. So here, let us take a look at the options first. They are translucent nocturnal species found in the American tropics. They are able to aggregate all the red blood cells in the body in one place. Which of the statements is or are incorrect? So here, which of them are incorrect? So first statement is also correct. Second statement is also correct. So here the answer is D. Neither one nor two. Die back basically Vishal is once the forest land starts getting degraded. That will lead to the emission of significant amount of carbon emissions in general. We talked about the fact that deforestation is the second biggest cause of carbon emission. So that is how Amazon die back. And even in the case of the forests of Indonesia which is being cut down for oil palm, that also can create that warming. Okay. Now, this is the glass frog. Now, why it has significantly intrigued the various researchers and scientists is because of the very basic fact here that they start appearing translucent. Now, how do they start appearing translucent? That is, by their special ability to aggregate all the red blood cells that they have and put it in their region of their liver. So while, while they are static, while they are still, 
in order to avoid any predator they become translucent and that is because see in general any species when the red blood cells they aggregate that is when clotting happens that is when various cardiovascular issues and various other diseases happen but these species have the ability to aggregate all of them and again bring them back into circulation without clotting that is why this has been in news okay so that is the aspect of the glass frogs okay what are climate tipping points okay climate tipping points basically these are those particular aspects or those particular events across the globe now if the temperature rises or if any of these events happen they will bring about their own rate of heating and cooling that is a climate tipping point okay for example ice sheet loss we do know that how a feedback loop fulfills the melting of the arctic ice arctic ice if it starts melting it will continue to feed back itself and accelerate the rate of melting so that is an example of climate tipping point now majority of these climate tipping points they are driven by the factor of albedo so for all of those for whom albedo is not clear please understand albedo represents reflective coefficient reflective coefficient of any surface any kind of surface how much are they able to reflect in general let's say we have an ice area or an ice sheet and let's say we have grassland now will both of them be able to absorb and reflect the same amount of solar rays obviously not let's say when solar rays they fall on ice almost 85 percent is reflected only around 15 percent is absorbed okay so 15 percent of heat is absorbed whereas when we talk about grasslands they will be able to reflect only around 25 to 30 percent let's assume 25 percent and they will be absorbing 75 percent is absorbed so what is the meaning of this this means that here the temperature rise will be quite significant whereas in this case the conditions will be colder why because only 15 percent of heat is absorbed so let's say this ice starts melting in that case what will happen let's suppose the ice melts and it exposes the water underneath now water has got an albedo close to around 0.3 so if that water is exposed that means around 30 percent is reflected albedo of 0.3 and 70 percent is absorbed that means earlier if the region would have been comprised completely of ice only 15 percent of heat was absorbed now 70 percent is being absorbed because the ice has collapsed the ice has melted so that means if 70 percent is absorbed that will bring significant rise in temperature so temperature will rise and this is a tipping point because if the temperature will rise here means more melting more melting means more exposure of water and this will feed itself and that is why this is a kind of a tipping point same is the case with boreal forest same is the case with mountain glacier as well okay i hope that is understood ratoon cropping dharmendra is basically a kind of a relay cropping which is practiced where as before the harvest of one kind of crop other crop is planted yes sunlight is reflected obviously torchlight won't be reflected in albedo sunlight is reflected again for the final time i will tell you the albedo in this case will be 0 0.85 albedo in this case will be 0 0.25 okay albedo in this case will be 0 0.3 this is the basic concept of geography i'm sure you would have studied this much going before prelims now with reference to the depletion of ozone layer consider the following statements the ozone hole is created only above the polar regions of the planet the ozone hole created over antarctica is much more prominent as compared to the ozone hole formation over the arctic region 
hydrofluorocarbons destroy the ozone layer and bring about warming of the planet. The only benefit of increased UV rays due to ozone hole is observed in the oceans with an increased growth of phytoplanktons. So which of them are correct statements in general? So first, the first statement if we take a look at it, the ozone hole is created only above the polar regions of the planet. Is that going to be correct? Absolutely not. Ozone hole is formed even above the region of the tropics in general. Okay, so ozone hole is created in a larger extent over the poles, but in some extent even above tropics. Now created over Antarctica is much more prominent as compared to the whole formation over the Arctic region. This is going to be correct. Why is it so? Why is it so that ozone hole over the region of Antarctica is much more prominent? That is because understand that Antarctica is a landmass. Arctic is a water body surrounded by land masses. So when we say a land mass in the form of Antarctica, that also means stability in terms of air parcel and air mass above it. So over the region of Antarctica, you have a very well defined circumpolar movement of air, which is observed, which is very regular, which, which is very fixated. Whereas over the region of Arctic, that circumpolar movement of air that is destroyed or that is disturbed because of heating and cooling and differential rate of heating and cooling of the nearby continental land masses. So because the air circulation is irregular over, over the region of Arctic, that is why the reaction which is required for the ozone hole depletion, that is also irregular. Whereas over the region of Antarctica, there is a kind of a stability associated. That is why you will have a much more prominent, much more clear uh, ozone hole which is formed. So the second statement is correct. HFCs, they destroy the ozone layer and bring about warming of the planet. This is incorrect. HFCs, they don't destroy the ozone layer, but they do bring about significant warming of the planet. And then, here please, again I would reiterate, please don't get confused between HCFCs and HFCs. HCFCs, they deplete the ozone hole, not HFCs. The only benefit of increased UV rays due to ozone hole is observed in oceans and with an increased growth of phytoplanktons. This is going to be incorrect because when you have an ozone hole created, the amount of ultraviolet rays will increase. They will start killing the phytoplanktons. The phytoplanktons which require sunshine in order to carry out photosynthesis, they are at the bottom of the food chain. They start getting destroyed. So that is where the entire marine ecosystem in terms of the food chain that is also disturbed. Which of them are correct? So here you will observe D that is two only that is going to be correct. Kigali agreement deals with HFCs that is because HFCs they carry out they have a very high global warming potential that is why. They are considered to be a safer alternative to HCFCs as you would be aware that anyways the ozone layer has been showing a remarkable level of recovery where we can expect that by 2060 we can have the recovered ozone layer that is because HFCs are used rather than HCFCs but at the same time they are causing an increased rate of warming that is why. Okay. Now green washing is associated with which of the following? Green washing is something which is also referred to as green sheen. It is associated with which of the following? Increasing the rate of carbon fertilization in a degraded landscape. Taxation loophole in order to circumvent the provisions of carbon cap and trade. Misleading information given by corporates to indicate environment friendly methods and countries fudging the carbon emission data to meet the emission targets. So greenwashing is basically the misleading information provided by the corporates whereby they provide the information to the consumers that they are carrying out environmentally friendly practices but in the garb of it they continue to exploit the environment by investing in 
the carbon intensive industries or carrying out let's say oil extraction oil exploration etc an example of this is basically where the companies or the industries they mask their requirement of profitability in the name of environmental friendliness for example in majority of the luxury hotel chains and in general in hotel chains you will find that they had started uh, sticking a kind of a note that in order to make the environment safer in order to preserve and protect the environment please reuse the linen please reuse the towels now it was found out later on that in the face of that they were saving huge chunks of their laundry bill in the name of being environment friendly now this is done in many of the corporates across many of the sectors of the world where they indicate a separate face to the consumers but at the back end they exploit the environment okay now which of the following species can be considered as ecosystem engineers? Ants, beavers, elephants, leopards, corals, and kelp. Which of them can be considered as ecosystem engineers? Now, what is an ecosystem engineer? Ecosystem engineers are basically those organisms which tend to modify the ecosystem around them in order to live there or in order to create a habitat around that. So, there are two types of ecosystem engineers, two categories of ecosystem engineers. You have autogenic, autogenic as well as allogenic, right? One, where they will modify their own body or body's biological systems in order to modify the ecosystem. For example, you have the case of trees. As the trees will grow from a sapling, their ability to handle various different types of inhabitants of the ecosystem that also changes quite rapidly whereas when we talk about allogenic they will end up modifying their surrounding ecosystem for example take the case of beavers now these beavers they are well known to create a kind of a dam they are the na nature's best dam builders they will obstruct the flowing water in order to have a kind of a stagnant water system and that in itself brings about many different species in that region, many different plankton species in that region, many different fish, etc. So the ecosystem is modified. So here, which can be considered as ecosystem engineers? Ants, they can be considered. They move through the various different parts of the soil. They provide natural aeration, bringing about various different species which can live in that region. Beavers, nature's dam builders, elephants. When the elephants, they move through a very well-grown grassland, they provide a kind of a passage, they control the, or they check the growth of these grasses, and in the weight of their uh, foot, basically small puddles are also created, which can provide habitat for many different species as well. So elephants will also be ecosystem engineers. Leopards won't be an ecosystem engineer. They are not engineers overall. Corals, they will modify the aquatic ecosystem, the marine environment in general. So there also they can be considered and so is the case with kelp. So in this case, which of them are ecosystem engineers? You have 1, 2, 3, 5 and 6, that is C. That is going to be the correct answer. Then, the next question. Consider the following statements in the context of recently conducted salty census 2023. Now, it is a biennial exercise conducted to measure the population of saltwater crocodiles in India. Saltwater crocodiles are found across the estuaries of eastern and western coastlines of India. In the last four decades, Bhitar Kanika has experienced a drastic fall in the population of saltwater crocodiles. We have to find out which of the statements is or are incorrect. So here, when we talk about the salty census, the salty census is to calculate the saltwater crocodile population. Now, saltwater crocodile in India is only found in certain designated areas. It is not to be found across the entirety of the coastline of the country. So, first of all, first statement, it is a biennial exercise, means to be carried out every two years. This is incorrect. It is an annual exercise. It is carried out annually. To measure 
the population of saltwater crocodiles. Then saltwater crocodiles are found across the estuaries of eastern and western coastline in India. Incorrect. Why? Western coastline significant proportion is not to be found. In the eastern, naturally, in the eastern coastline you will find it across Odisha, across Sundarbans. Some parts of Tamil Nadu have reported the sightings of saltwater crocodile and in the Andaman Nicobar Island group that is where you will find the saltwater crocodile population. So that is where second is incorrect. In the last four decades, Bitar Kanika has experienced a drastic fall in the population. This is incorrect. In the span of around 40 years, the population has increased from double digits to somewhere close to around 1800, 1793, close to that number of saltwater crocodiles have been reported. So obviously, third is also incorrect. So in this case, D, 1, 2 and 3, all of them are incorrect. Now, after that, moving on to the last question of the day. With regards to the Asian Waterbird Census 2023, consider the following statements. It was first held in India in 1987. In India, it is jointly held by Bombay Natural History Society and Wetlands International. It also gives a status about the health of the wetlands. It helps in implementation of Bonn Convention and Convention on Biological Diversity. So, which of the above mentioned statements is or are correct? So, the first statement, it was first held in India in 1987. This is correct because it started in India and later on it spread into or it was carried out in various parts of Asia and then it spread into the overall Asian water bird census. In India, it is jointly held by BNHS or Bombay Natural History Society and the Wetland International. So, this is also going to be correct. It also gives a status about the health of the wetlands. Basically, how is it so? So when you carry out water bird census, waterfowl in general, now these particular birds, they will always give you an indication if the population declines in an area, that means somehow that particular region is either polluted or there is some issue about, let's say, encroachment, loss of biodiversity, maybe invasive alien species, some or the other problem might come into existence. So that is why it gives a status about the health of the wetlands is also correct. Then, health and implementation of Bonn Convention and CBD. What is Bonn Convention? When we talk about Bonn Convention, it talks about the Convention on Migratory Species, the species who migrate from one region to another. So if the health of the wetland is degraded, species will not come. So that will be reflected in the census itself. So this is also correct. So here, D, that is 1, 2, 3 and 4, all of them are the correct answer. So that is what completes the discussion for environment and ecology. In the past three sessions, we have managed to uh, basically discuss close to around 80 different questions and relevant topics associated with those questions and those areas as well. So that is something which should come significantly in handy if you revise those particular questions and also in the questions and the topics associated nearby that will be very helpful for your examination. I hope that these sessions were helpful to you. If And also do let us know that what has been your strike rate in the discussion of these questions, how many have you been able to do it correctly and how many of you of them did you find it to be very difficult in general. So that has been the endeavor. Overall, if you like these sessions, please don't forget to click on the like, share and subscribe button. And that will be all from my side. All the best for your prelims examination. Just revise multiple times these same areas. Don't open up new portions of content. And you should do particularly well in the examination. All the best. Good luck. Goodbye. Thank you.